So heat makes it much more difficult for us to regulate our own body temperatures and can be really stressful specifically on the heart. And this is really because the heart needs to work much more harder for us to keep our bodies cool. So in extreme temperature days, the heart can pump up to four times more blood to try to get the blood up to our skin. By 2050, climate change is gonna cause an additional 14 and a half million deaths. And of these 14 and a half million deaths, 1.6 of them are going to be due to heat stress and heat strain. So I'm sure that we've all had a difficult time sleeping at night during, uh, during peak heat periods. And then of course this reduced sleeping uh, patterns that we're finding are then also going to reduce our cognitive brain function, make us much more perhaps irritable during the day, make it much more difficult for us to focus and to concentrate. And all of these things can really be uh, attributed to extreme heat. The best way that we can really protect ourselves is to drink as much water as possible. This is because extreme heat really does cause dehydration through sweating. For example, we can see heat cramps uh, or cramps in the muscle cramps in the body, which is probably more in the mild area. And then one of the most severe uh, versions of heat stress is heat stroke. And this occurs when our body temperatures rise to, to over 40 degrees Celsius. As we continue to see hotter days, it's really important that employers are making it more easy for employees to, to really safeguard their own health. And the best way uh, to do this is to make sure that during those peak hours that we're reducing our time outside. This could be for outdoor workers working more in the morning or in the evening, or even traveling during the day. Uh, is it possible to work from home? There are lots of ways that we're already seeing cities and, and countries implement adaptation strategies. This can include, for example, in Singapore, we're seeing uh, cool roof systems, and this includes uh, reflective materials where we can ensure that the heat is actually not absorbed, but it's reflected, and also green roofs. So for example, vegetation, flowers, and plants, this can also help to, to keep infrastructure cool. Sometimes people talk about teachers as knowledge workers, and I think if you talk about teachers as knowledge workers in the current context with AI, um, you lose that sort of socio-emotional, you lose the mentorship, you lose the coaching, you lose, you lose the relational. So I really like to talk about them as wisdom workers, because it's, it's one thing to have knowledge, it's another thing to know how to apply it ethically and morally um, to the benefit of, of many. experience of education is more than just the delivery of content. It's um, relational, it's not transactional. And um, that's, that's what I'm seeing is happening right now with, with AI. Education is the, the place where we build societies and we build democracy. It's, it's the place where different viewpoints are heard and scientific methods are, are learned and developed. It's the place where people of, of different religions and, um, and identities can come together and their rights can be respected. Education is the place where we 
weave together a narrative about who we are and more importantly who we want to be. And the teachers um, are those that are, are weaving that. What we worry about as teachers is that the digital divide um, and the addition of AI without any kind of equity plan is going to exacerbate that so that the, those with resources and means are going to continue to signal, have the signaling effects of those types of education systems, those benefits, and that other people's kids, those that we can't afford to educate, um, they will sit in a room with a chat bot, right? They won't have the, they won't have the same interaction, they won't have the same mentoring, they won't have the same kind of support. Ninety percent of our peace processes fail within five years. That's stark when you think about how much time and energy and effort goes into making them. Um, and when you have women in civil society included at the agenda setting phase, when they get to be there to define what needs to be on that peace building agenda, that conflict um, resolution agenda, that peace process priority list, um, we find that they're 35 percent more likely to last 15 years. I first got involved in peace building very accidentally. I was a final year medical student when the Lebanon Revolution broke out. Um, and as many know, hospitals uh, often become places of conflict, get attacked during conflict. I always found hospitals to be this incredible place of peace and of hope and of prayer. And of and so to, to witness them become a place of conflict, I think was really stark for me. And then to go a step further and witness the way in which women and children were particularly vulnerable in conflict um, and were often overlooked when it came to being part of the solution and part of the peace building. Resolution 1325, which really looked at the, the role of women in peace and security, really emphasized that yes, women do have unique vulnerabilities in conflict, but equally importantly, they have unique leadership in conflict. I think oftentimes in conflict, we defer to those with guns. They get an automatic seat at the table. Um, we create space for militia members, we create space for um, political insurgents, we create space for those that are, you know, kind of essential to the perpetuation of the conflict. Um, and oftentimes what they bring to the negotiating table is just enough for them. 
not necessarily what it takes to rebuild a society, to build sustainable peace. When a conflict is happening, we immediately want to solve for the security challenge. It makes perfect sense. It is, it's the right thing to do. People are dying. We want an immediate solution. And yet that immediate solution should not come at the cost of a long-term, viable, sustainable, dignified life for people. A notion that we can solve for conflict without really looking at sustainable access, sustainable education, sustainable economies and opportunities, I think is somewhat unrealistic. Um, a lot of conflict is really anchored in resource scarcity. It's anchored in, um, it's anchored in the fact that people don't have enough to eat. It's anchored in cost of living. Mm -hmm.